You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 306. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How's everybody doing today? As always, excited to be here today with part one of Shine Up Your Recipes. I have been talking to you guys and to people in my Confident Cookbook Writer Facebook group, and we've been talking about recipes, and several questions have come up about recipes and recipe writing recipe development, and some mindset things around recipes. So I thought what I would do today and for our episode next week is do a two-part Shine Up Your Recipes series. So this is what we're going to talk about today and next week is recipes. And this also kicks off a continuation of something I've been talking to my email list about, which is during the month of July, I have been offering complimentary recipe refine and shine audits. This is an opportunity for you to connect with me live with your recipes. And we can talk a little bit about the status of your recipes and what your next steps might be to help get your recipes published in a cookbook. So even if you have family recipes you want to publish, if you have customers or clients you want to publish recipes for, or if you want to publish your recipes for in a cookbook for a general audience, uh, please sign up for one of these recipe refine and shine audits. July is the perfect month to do this. It's kind of a slower month in terms of maybe the work we want to do in our kitchen. But what's going to happen here in the next uh, six to eight weeks is it's going to be September. And in September, we often get another little burst of energy. And then we think, okay, what can I get done on the goals that I have before the end of the year. So if we look at our recipes now and we kind of see the status of where they are and we talk a little bit about what's the best way for you to get them published, then you will be all set when the beginning of September rolls around. So there's a link in the show notes to sign up for the complimentary recipe refine and shine audit, but the link is at www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash recipes shine www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash recipe shine okay so let's dive into part one and today's focus of this is going to be about recipe development about confidence about your recipes about the number of recipes you should be creating for a book and about knowing if your recipes will be well received And then next week, we're going to talk about recipe development and writing more, and we're going to talk about uh, organization of your recipes and some tools that I use to actually organize my recipes, including some software that I use so that everything is ready, not only for my cookbook proposal, if I'm working on one, but also my cookbook manuscript. Okay, so question number one is, how can I find the time to develop and write recipes? So this is something that comes up very commonly when we are looking at starting a project or working on a project in addition to the life that we already live. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about how I found time to do what I've done related to my cookbooks and my business and recording podcasts every week. It's the same thing that you need to do about your cookbook and your recipes. You have to decide you have the time. And you have to decide that you want to use some of your time to work on this project. I have thought a ton of about this, and I've thought about my own life and how in the world did I write and get published four times in the midst of raising my children from the ages of uh, 12 all the way now up to being out of college and on their own. How did I do that? And I really believe that it's I decided it was something I wanted to do. As a goal I truly set for myself, and I decided I had the time to do it. And magically, when we think that way, 
guess what happens? We find time to do it. And of course, I piggyback this on a life where I loved to read and write cookbooks. I love to write recipes. I love to cook. So my life was already kind of set up in the things that I was attracted to doing. Um, so if you have a life where you love cooking and baking, you love cookbooks, you love recipes, you love reading recipes, you love collecting recipes, you're set up just the same as I was. The secret, though, is starting to document everything you do. That's the habit that I had to instill on top of the cooking life I already had. I started keeping track of um, my shopping, started keeping track of what I was cooking and baking, started keeping track of uh, ways that I put food together, recipes I was putting together, everything that I cooked or baked in a notebook. And so I started to see some trends and what was going on and wrote the seasonal cookbook first and then got approached about writing my second Kentucky cookbook from someone who wanted a Kentucky-based food writer. So the way that you find the time is you decide you have the time and then you start to use the time that you're already cooking or baking to document what is going on in your uh, kitchen. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about development and writing and um, some of the other things. But when it comes to time, it's really just a decision that we have the time. And if you don't have the time, I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, but I suspect that if you ask that question, how can I find the time to write and develop recipes, it's because you sort of want to do it. And I truly believe that these things that we desire to do that aren't like urgent, aren't like pressing, are true callings from the true part of ourself that wants to be expressed in the world. So the second thing I had to do was give myself permission to let that part of me shine. So I decided I had the time. I built some habits around writing everything down. And I really believe that my true self was connected to this desire that I had to write recipes and write cookbooks. And here I am, uh, having done that, doing that, and now helping uh, beautiful people all over the world do the same thing. Okay, number two, how can I be confident that my ideas aren't repeats of other recipes? You know, this is an excellent question, and I certainly, from this vantage point, working with cookbook writers and now receiving cookbooks of people who want to be on the show and thinking about my own cookbook ideas, can see that there are there is repetition in the food world. There's uh, different books written in different ways about similar topics, similar types of recipes. The confidence comes from knowing that you have a lived experience of this food and this whatever it is you want to talk about that is unique and authentic to you. And that if you and I were each going to write a book about the very same sorts of food, that we would end up having two different books because you're confidently standing in the authenticity of who you are, how you're cooking, who you're cooking for, how you shop, how you prepare, all the things that you do uniquely, and I'm standing in the confidence of how I am doing it. And that confidence comes from being willing to express our own unique lived experience of what's going on with the ingredients in our own kitchens. That's where the confidence comes from. The confidence doesn't come from the outcome. The confidence comes from the lived experience that we have of all of these things. Now, part of a cookbook proposal is looking at competition studies, other books that are written about similar topics, to make sure that we have a unique spin on a topic. But the recipes may very well be the same if there are Kentucky cookbooks being written. Uh, You know, there are certain foods that everybody in Kentucky loves to eat, loves to talk about, and it's definitely uh, repeated. But my experience of it and other cookbook authors' experiences of it have been different, and we've been willing to stand in that I, from a home perspective, maybe others, some Kentucky cookbook writers from a restaurant perspective, and we share our stories based on our own experience. Number three, how can I create enough? Oh, I'm not sure I can create enough of my own recipes. Uh, That's fine. If you hone this all down and you decide on a cookbook topic, um, you're welcome to ask for contributions of recipes from other people. Just be sure to give them credit. You might want to test them, be sure they work in your own kitchen, and uh, that's done all the time with contribution-type cookbooks. My second cookbook, Tasting Kentucky Favorite Recipes from the Bluegrass State, 
was a book of 100 contributed recipes that I gave everybody credit for. So if you want to see an example of that, you can take a look at that book and see how I actually gave credit and the types of things that I wrote in the head notes about the places where I got the recipes from. And it's been a wildly successful book, still in print, and very popular around the time of the Kentucky Derby. Okay, number four, how many recipes should I include in the actual book? I asked someone this question the other day, one of the people that I had on for an interview, and I believe it was um, one of the women who came to talk about hybrid cookbook publishing, but I think she mentioned around 75 is what she is seeing kind of as an average for cookbooks. Um, could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, could be quite a bit more for some cookbooks, but 75 recipes is about the amount that um, she was seeing. Now, for a submission, if you're writing a cookbook proposal, the beauty of a proposal is you don't have to have all 75 recipes fully developed. You develop your concept, you develop your competition study, you develop a bio, you develop a marketing plan, and only maybe need to submit one sample chapter, which could be about eight to 10 different recipes. So that's why I love cookbook proposals. It gives us a chance to get our cookbook idea out there the way that we write our books and want to write our books out there and see if we can get a publishing contract. So for submission, maybe just one sample chapter. And then the last question for today is, how do I know my recipes will be well received? This is a very common fear of ours that even if we love the recipes we create and that people love the food that we cook from the recipes we create, and maybe we share our recipes with our family, it takes on a whole different level when we know that we're sharing our recipes on a bigger stage, maybe in front of a publisher or in front of people who will be preparing these recipes when they don't even really have a relationship with us. But the way we know that they're well-received is we let people try them and give us their feedback, their honest feedback about the recipes. Now, that feels a little scary, and part of our brain says, I don't want you to do that because what if they don't like it? Well, that's always possible. Um, Not all the recipes that I have written and put out in the world have been well-received. I typically tend to love uh, things made with turmeric and coriander and cumin and coconut milk and onion and garlic, and in my pantry cookbooks, I put several recipes that included those ingredients. And some of those recipes were not very well received by one particular person that wrote a comment to me because she didn't like those kinds of ingredients. So there's always a risk in that. But that doesn't mean that I don't like them, that people I cook for don't like them, and that a lot of other people don't like them. We're not going to be able to please everybody all the time. um, And that should never be a way that we stop ourselves from moving forward. Um, We're never going to get 100% approval from everybody. It's most important that we love our recipes. We have done everything we can to create recipes that taste really good. We let other people try them and test them to be sure that they taste really good. And when that is the case, then we put them in a package or in a book or we send them out and we you know, get them published and release them to the world. And people's response to our recipes is their response We just have to know that we definitely put our best foot forward in developing and writing them. So that is it for today's part one of Shine Up Your Recipes. And remember, if you would like a complimentary recipe refine and shine audit, go to www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash recipe shine. There's a link in the show notes, and I would love to talk to you about your recipes. And we can then talk about the best path to get them published. Would self-publishing be best for you or hybrid publishing or traditional publishing? So that is it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co. 